Hello, my good friends and colleagues. How are you all feeling today? I hope everything is splendid and your week is going swimmingly. So today I am going to create a video I thought I would never make. We're going to cover a familiar subject, which is finasteride, but not in a way you may be used to me doing so. So before I delve into the subject matter, I want to stress that in the realm of science and academics, it is our solemn duty to look at data as objectively as we possibly can. Scientific research is not gospel, after all, and it isn't good enough to just present your argument with scientific research. Hell, even flat earthers will often cite sources. So you need to do a lot more than just cite sources. You also need to be able to properly scrutinize any data you present as evidence in order to make sure the outcomes of whatever study you're citing were justified by a strong methodology. Like, for example, if I were to make a claim that finasteride doesn't work and then only present a single case study involving just one person to back up my argument, then that obviously would not be sufficient data to back up my claim. Of course, Sometimes you actually do come across data that dramatically shakes your perceptions on certain treatments. As many of you guys know, I have created dozens of videos as well as entire video series dedicated to debunking what I thought were outlandish claims about the dangers of finasteride and suppressing DHT. I'll link some of those videos below for reference, but what's important to remember is that my conclusions in those videos were based on what I thought was the best data available. I didn't create any of the videos with the goals of reaching a conclusion favorable to my biases. Rather, I just wanted to examine the research that people were citing to back up their claims about finasteride being dangerous, as well as DHT not being a trash hormone. And based on everything I saw, I came to the conclusion that finasteride's dangers are dramatically overstated. I felt that post-finasteride syndrome was a myth, that DHT is a trash hormone, and even though I have always acknowledged that side effects with finasteride can happen, I believed at the time that the side effects were nevertheless dramatically overblown. But... It turns out I was completely wrong. I was wrong about everything. I have created hundreds of videos on this channel, and the majority of my content is dedicated towards countering the fear-mongering about finasteride, so I never in a million years thought it would be possible that everything I have ever researched about finasteride would turn out to be completely wrong. It is wrong, though. Or more accurately, I should say that I was wrong. I know I was wrong because one of my viewers brought up a post from the hair loss subreddit known as Trustless, and this post includes links to scientific research that is absolutely irrefutable. When I saw the post, I initially laughed it off thinking, oh, look at this, it's another theory that explains everything from Trustless. Remember when they created that broccoli theory and they all got super triggered when I debunked it? Yeah, what a bunch of morons, right? So, anyways, I examined the research fully, and I did so expecting to find massive holes in it that I could proceed to debunk and then ridicule in a new video, but it turns out that this post has changed everything. Not only does this research prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that finasteride is one of the most dangerous drugs on the market, but it also proves that DHT is not a trash hormone. On the contrary, this proves that DHT is an essential hormone and that people who take drugs like 5-AR inhibitors to suppress their DHT are doing severe bodily harm that will result in permanent damage to both the body and the mind. So reading this post and the link studies got my heart pounding very, very quickly and I felt that it was getting harder and harder for me to breathe because this research was completely dismantling any illusions I had about finasteride's safety profile. I also realized that I myself played a huge role in the promotion of this poisonous drug. And honestly, guys, I really feel an overwhelming sense of guilt knowing that the advice I have given to you all has probably injured people irreparably since I know many people have told me that they have started this horrible drug as a result of the advice that I have given them. I know I probably can never undo the wrongs I have made completely, but at the very least, let me tell you all this. If you are on finasteride right now, please, for the love of all that is holy and righteous in this world, and for the sake of your own health, please, please stop taking finasteride. Your hair is not worth destroying your life and health over. It may not be too late for you to save yourself, so please, throw that finasteride in the trash can, or better yet, burn it, and never touch a 5-AR inhibitor ever again. Sadly, though, despite my warnings now, 
I know it is probably too late for some people, and I know that the only way I can even begin to redeem myself for all the evil I have done in promoting this horrible drug is to dedicate all of my resources and time and showing the world the overwhelming scientific proof that finasteride doesn't belong anywhere in your body, in your house, on planet Earth, or anywhere else in the entire Milky Way galaxy. These studies linked from Tressless have changed everything and have proven that everything I have ever believed or promoted about finasteride was a complete lie. And I intend to do everything I can to expose the dangers of this diabolical drug so it is taken off the market forever and so that there will never be another victim of finasteride ever again. So, sorry, this is, this is just hard for me, but, you know, of course... As you guys know, I have a lot of work to do before I can achieve any of this. So to start off with, I think the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to delete all pro finasteride content from my channel completely. And then I'm going to begin a new video series explaining the importance of DHT and why it is actually one of the most important hormones in the entire body, as well as discussing just how catastrophic inhibiting this vital hormone is to our mental and physical well-being. So before I do any of that, there is still just one thing I have to say. April fucking fools! I was just kidding, Jooms. Finasteride is safe, effective, and it is God's gift to mankind. In fact, I think it is about time for me to take my own finasteride right now. See this cute little Proscar tablet? Let me see if you guys can see that. It's probably a little blurry, but that's my quartered Proscar tablet. That's 1.25 milligrams of finasteride. Let me go ahead and take it. Ah... Ah, I took it with uh, coffee because, you know, that speeds up the blood flow, right? And man, the taste of defeating the slaphead curse is sweet. So I am terribly sorry if I fooled any of you hair loss witchers. Let's get serious for a moment. The post in question is just more typical bullshit fear-mongering from Tressless, which is really sad since Tressless is supposed to be a subreddit about helping people fight hair loss, yet more often than not, the only content I see posting there 90% of the time is baseless fear-mongering about finasteride that is likely to scare off people who are still on the fence about whether or not they should start treatment. Honestly though, I can't be too mad because at least it gave me the idea of making an April Fool's video, which is something I have never done before in the nine year history of this channel. So thank you, Tressless. So grab your silver swords, my fellow hair loss witchers, and let's tear this shitty post to absolute pieces so we can go back to enjoying not being bald, miserable, sexless, slaphead losers who have to spread fear and misinformation about finasteride as a means of coping with being too afraid and dickless to use the drug. So... The title of the post is, quote, DHT is not a trash hormone, guys, unquote. And the general gist of the post is that there are hundreds of studies that show that DHT is, in fact, not a trash hormone. Out of those hundreds of studies, apparently only two were worth linking to in this post, but I'm sure the original poster could produce the other hundreds of studies if he really wanted to. But he didn't. So let's take a closer look at the two studies he did link to his Reddit post. Well, here's the title of the first study. It's titled, quote, Contribution of Dihydrotestosterone to Male Sexual Behavior, unquote. And it looks like it's from 1995, so not exactly the most recent article. Like, I think it came out the same time as the PlayStation 1. But let's not jump to conclusions just because the article is a little old. Let's look and see what kind of methodology it used. So... The authors of the study are Greek, and what they did is that they took 100 male recruits to the Greek army and drew blood on them the first day they reported to duty. At the same time, they gave them a questionnaire to be filled out. Believe it or not, they asked these raw recruits to estimate the number of orgasms they had per week over the previous month. To try to make them answer more honestly, they told the recruits that they didn't care if the orgasms occurred during sexual intercourse, from masturbation, or from nocturnal emissions, also known as wet dreams. I'm not really sure that would make them any more honest about the number of orgasms they had, but who knows. The age of these guys entering service ranged from 18 to 22 years old. The average number of orgasms that they had the month before reporting for duty was 3.9 orgasms per week, which isn't a whole lot compared to today, and that's because dial-up internet porn in 1995 really sucked, and trust me, I'm old enough to remember that. So anyways... When the investigators looked at the physical characteristics and habits of the recruits, the only factor that correlated with having more orgasms per week was age. That's right, the guys joining the army at age 22 had more orgasms per week than those who were age 18. I'm not sure what that really means, but that was one of the main findings of the study. The other finding was that the number of orgasms didn't seem to correlate with testosterone levels, but there was a correlation with DHT levels. So... 
The authors concluded that age and DHT affected the number of orgasms these young men experienced per week. Regarding age, they say, quote, Within the age range study, a difference of three years corresponded to an increase of the weekly number of orgasms by about two. This increase is likely to reflect socially conditioned enhancement of opportunities with increasing age, possibly including marital status, which was not ascertained in this study. Unquote. Regarding DHT, they state, quote, an increase of dihydrotestosterone by about two standard deviations, 1.36 nanomoles per liter, was associated with an increase of the weekly number of orgasms by at least one, and conceivably more depending on the extent of biologically generated variation and consequent misclassification, unquote. After that, the authors then admit that their methodology and the accuracy of their hormone assays weren't exactly Nobel Prize material. They say, quote, there is undoubtedly misclassification in the reporting of the frequency of orgasms as well as in the laboratory determination of dihydrotestosterone and the other hormones, unquote. So we are not talking about men with decreased libido or sexual dysfunction here. We're talking about a difference of one or two in the number of orgasms per week in a population that most likely just made up the number to begin with. There was no way to verify any of the data here. It depended on the honesty of the recruits and also on their memory. They weren't even required to keep a diary for a month. They just had to come up with the information on their first day of reporting to army training when I bet they had a lot more on their minds than how many orgasms they were having over the last month. Remember, this was based on orgasms per week over the last month. Do any of you chooms remember how many orgasms you had four weeks ago? Okay, so obviously this paper is complete bullshit, but what about the second study linked in the Reddit post, which is from Good Korea, and shows the rate of sexual side effects was much, much higher than originally stated? Well, let's go ahead and take a look at it. Wait a minute. This isn't a study from Good Korea. It was published in a Good Korean journal, but it is actually from our old friend Dr. Trash, who is notable as being the number one fear monger of alphanasteride on the entire internet. It is an article from 2014 titled, quote, The Dark Side of 5A Reductase Inhibitors Therapy, Sexual Dysfunction, High Gleason Grade Prostate Cancer, and Depression, unquote. Now, I've gone over this article before, and I'll link some videos on it below. It's almost completely based on animal data and very few human studies, but the article generates a narrative that finasteride has the potential to cause all sorts of horrible side effects, even if there is no evidence that these side effects occur in actual human beings. However, the Reddit post specifically claims that Dr. Trash shows that the risk of sexual effects is much higher than originally stated. Well, as you can see, Dr. Trash presents in his article a table looking at the incidence of different side effects in different studies of finasteride. So, even though he has cherry-picked the studies, these results aren't that different from other finasteride studies, except for the outlier study that has around 50 to 60% sexual side effects for both finasteride and the control group. The absolute difference in the incidence of side effects between finasteride and placebo is between 2 and 4%, which is basically what most, if not all, the other finasteride studies already show. So an incidence of 2 or 4 cases out of 100 is not that big of an incidence. So despite my critics saying I claim that finasteride has no side effects, I have not once ever said that. I have always admitted that like any other drug on the market, finasteride does have side effects, but the incidence of side effects is low and the sides usually improve with the continuation of the drug or titrating the dose down and the side effects always go away with discontinuation. Also, just two years after Dr. Trash published his dark side paper, a large meta-analysis of finasteride and dutasteride studies was published. In this meta-analysis, data was pooled from 17,494 subjects. This this included studies where finasteride or dutasteride was used for benign prostatic hyperplasia, also known as BPH, or for androgenic alopecia. When five air blockers were used for BPH, the relative risk of sexual dysfunction from taking these drugs was 2.56 times that of the control group. Of course, these men were older since they were being treated for BPH, and if they were taking finasteride, they were on a 5 mg per day dose of finasteride, which is 5 times higher than the 1 mg dose that is prescribed for androgenic alopecia. When when they looked at the meta-analysis of studies of finasteride or dutasteride used for androgenic alopecia, the investigators actually found that the risk for sexual sides was only 1.21 higher with these drugs compared with placebo. However, this risk was not even statistically significant, so I do believe there is a small increased risk of sexual side effects from finasteride and dutasteride use, but I would never say that the studies showed that the risk is much higher than originally stated. So to wrap this all up, this Reddit post is just more outdated debunked 
bullshit and it barely even warrants a response video and if it weren't for the fact that it provided good content for an April Fool's video, I probably wouldn't have even addressed it at all as I have far more important subjects to cover in the near future and we'll be getting to all that soon enough so please check back soon chooms and I am very sorry if the title of my video gave any of you a heart attack so happy April Fool's Day I guess. See you all next time. God bless.